Greetings, salam. My name is Milad Odabai. I am a postdoctoral research associate at the Princeton University's Sharmin and Bijan Mosavva Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. On behalf of myself and my colleagues at the center, I welcome you to another session of our virtual events and book launches. Um, I, in today's event, we are hearing from Dr. Dr. <laughs> Professor Sima Shahsari about their recently published book, The Politics of Rightful Killing, Civil Society, Gender, and Sexuality in Weblogistan. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Shahsari and invite them to speak about their book. After Dr. Shahsari's remarks, we will have a brief conversation where uh, they will guide us through some of the themes of the book. Uh, Professor Sima Shahsari is a political anthropologist specializing in the transnational study of gender and sexuality, digital media, migration, and violence in relationship to the Middle East and its diasporas. They are an associate professor in the Department of Gender and Women and Sexualities Studies at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Shahsari earned their PhD in cultural and social anthropology at Stanford University and have held postdoctoral positions at the University of Pennsylvania's Wolf Humanities Center and the Women's and Gender Studies Department at the University of Houston. Professor Shahsari's writings appear in many journals and forums, including Sexualities, Femi Sexualities, Feminist Review, the International Journal of Middle East Studies, and the edited volume, Queer Necropolitics. Their book, Politics of Rightful Killing, Civil Society, Gender and Sexuality in Weblogistan, was published this year with Duke University Press. Politics of Rightful Killing is an analysis of Weblogistan, the once thriving Persian blog sphere as a site of cyber governmentality. The book theorizes the production of gendered, national, and neoliberal subjectivities through online and offline heteronormative disciplinary practices and techniques of normalization. The book's title, Politics of Rightful Killing, points to one of its central arguments. In our contemporary moment, when the United States is caught up in a never ending war on terror, Professor Shahsari demonstrates how a discourse of rights, democracy, and freedom is part of a political calculus that subjects populations allegedly lacking rights and freedoms to death through war and sanctions. This is a timely intervention, especially for those of us who think about and speak about Iran. Um, after leaving the Iran nuclear deal, the United States is presently conducting a maximum pressure campaign of sanctions on that country. These sanctions have centrally contributed to the emergence of a grave social and political situation that Iranian analysts and politicians frequently compare to the period of war with Iraq, the 1980s. This was a period of political repression, socioeconomic underdevelopment, and the loss of around 1 million lives that in many ways put us on the path on which we find ourselves today in Iran, in the region, and also globally. The current sanctions have gra gravely impacted the Iranian infrastructure and access to resources, and thus Iran's response to the gl ongoing global pandemic. Not only has Dr. Professor Shah Sari analyzed this situation as a scholar, but they have also been mobilizing against it as an activist. And I will end here by noting Dr. Shah Sari's activism, not only in relationship to sanctioned politics of rightful killing, but also in relationship to other forms of sanctioned violence, including those of rampant racism, xenophobia, and anti-Black violence, around us and among us. So let me now invite Dr. Shahsari to introduce their book. I'm also hoping that you will, Dr. Shahsari, orient us in relationship to the current moment and current and ongoing struggles that you um, are working on. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Milo John, for that generous introduction. And um, also uh, many thanks to your center and uh, 
uh, Behruz Khahramani for the invitation. Um, I'm very honored uh, to be a part of uh, the series that you're doing. I've been following them and um, they're uh, fantastic. Um, so let me start by um, uh, talking a little bit about why I did this research on uh, Weblogistan or Weblogistan, the Iranian blogosphere, which as you mentioned, um, was active, uh, it's still active, but not, uh, you know, the way that it was in the first decade of the um, new millennium. It was uh, around 2003 that um, I started doing research on um, Iranian satellite television programs that um, were produced in mostly Los Angeles and broadcast to Iran and um, other places in the world. And the reason for that was that, I don't know if you remember, but in 2003, there were student movements happening in Iran. And um, this was during Khatami's era. And um, uh, the, uh, I was at a friend's house. I didn't have satellite uh, TV myself. And I noticed all these Iranian channels. Uh, every one of them uh, had basically an anchor sitting there and, you know, just talking very passionately about uh, the student movements in Iran. The student movements actually were really about privatization uh, and the students' uh, discontents around that and, of course, social freedoms. But all these um, diasporic TV um, uh, programs where uh, make it seem like there was a revolution happening. I mean, if you watch TV right then, you would think that, oh my God, you know, there is a regime change and, um, you know, people are going to, the royalists uh, were very happy and all that. And it was fascinating. And uh, what really um, attracted uh, or uh, took my attention was uh, the gendered language that these anchors were using. Um, one in particular said, uh, well, you know, there were callers carrying supposedly from Iran and other parts of the world. And um, uh, uh, one of the anchors said, uh, I don't even know how to translate that into English. Let me sacrifice myself for your masculinity, something like that. And uh, I was really fascinated by this. And I thought, <clears throat> well, let me see, as a student of anthropology, um, what uh, how these programs are received by Iranians in diaspora. Um, so I uh, did some research in Los Angeles. I actually interviewed um, pretty much all of these satellite TV, uh, TV programs. And I noticed that there was this sense of cutthroat competition. You know, one was saying, I have been an entertainer for um, decades. Uh, such and such had a Cholo Kababi in Iran, and now they have started a television program. And the other one would say, you know, I know about politics. This guy was a motrib, you know, entertainer in Iran, and now he's become a politician. So um, it was really interesting to see how they were really trying to um, uh, uh, compete with each other. And I realized that after, you know, digging further and talking to them, that at that point, uh, this was during uh, Bush's presidency, Condoleezza Rice had promised a $70 million budget for democratization projects through diasporic media. So they were really uh, fighting for that uh, money. Uh, and at the end of the day, actually, the money didn't go to any of them. Uh, you know, the uh, Department of State uh, started uh, 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 Voice of America um, uh, Persian, uh, which is basically a kind of a legacy of world, uh, Cold War, um, you know, propaganda uh, media of the United States. And they gave some of the money to some internet um, uh, basically, uh, websites, uh, some, um, uh, you know, uh, basic, uh, some websites that took some of that money. But in any case, um, so I did some field work there, and then I went to Turkey and talked to some Iranians who had just left Iran, <clears throat> some of whom were students who had basically, uh, who were getting out of Iran because of uh, the repression. Some were visitors who basically working class people who would travel between Turkey and Iran um, and take back some, you know, whatever uh, clothing to sell. And so um, I noticed that not many people actually watch these uh, satellite television programs that are broadcast from uh, Los Angeles, uh, or they didn't at least at that point. Um, and in particular, one young person told me, look, you know, Iranian um, satellite television programs don't need to be researched 
they need to be boycotted. Tahrir nadaran, tahrim daran. So um, people basically told me, look, you have to look at blogs. That's where it's happening. And uh, I also noticed that at the same time, there were all these um, uh, reports in international media about uh, Persian blogging. And the narrative was something like this, that uh, you know, because there, uh, there's no freedom of speech in Iran, Iranians are blogging in massive numbers. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Persian blogging was uh, the number four blogging language and blogging is indexed by language. At that point, uh, blogging was uh, in Farsi, in Persian, was number four. And of course, people who blogged in Persian were mostly from Iran, of course, some from Afghanistan, um, you know, uh, even Tajikistan, they would write in uh, actually uh, Russian alphabet. So it was mainly really from Iran. And so I decided to read Persian blogs uh, for, um, uh, for you know, a few months, I just read blogs uh, religiously, and I noticed that um, unlike this narrative of lack of freedom of speech in Iran, um, leading to Iranians blogging, many of the most popular Iranian bloggers who were actually blogging about politics of Iran were writing from outside of Iran. So the popular ones, uh, even someone who was called the godfather of Persian blogging or Abul blogger was blogging from Toronto. <coughs> so uh, I became really curious to uh, see how is it that blogging is gonna uh, uh, free Iran? And uh, one of the things that um, uh, was definitely prominent in this narrative was the gendered aspect of it. Uh, all these news articles about uh, blogs give a voice to Iranian women and uh, you know, all, all these kind of uh, gendered narratives of liberation um, and the assumption that uh, Weblogistan uh, was uh, the place where Iranian civil society uh, was flourishing. So um, I read uh, blogs and then I started my own blog. Um, so I was lurking for a few months and then I started my own blog um, and went to Toronto uh, where, like I said, a, a good number of very um, uh, popular uh, bloggers lived. <clears throat> and uh, as I was uh, reading the blogs, to me, it became very um, apparent that yes, Weblogistan is a site of uh, Iranian transnational civil society. There are a lot of conversations happening. It's not the only site of uh, uh, Iranian civil society, or is not the first one. Of course, I argue in the book that civil society uh, was thriving and existed in post-revolutionary Iran. And um, the reason that these conversations were happening in Weblogistan was exactly because of the pre-existing um, civil society in Iran. And that uh, the conversations that happening in Weblogistan really um, were not that different than what was happening offline. So this kind of binary of online and offline, I argue is very much artificial. That of course, online worlds are very much produced by discourses and practices offline and vice versa. So um, what was interesting to me was that this idea of blogging liberating Iranian women um, was not um, quite the case because um, uh, you know, the, even among people who were saying uh, we are practicing democracy and trying to imagine um, a democratic future for Iran, um, the very heteronormative discourses that existed offline existed online, and also the imaginations of Iranianness were uh, very much gendered, heteronormative, and raced. So there was a particular kind of um, class and raced Iranianness uh, against Iran's neighbors, Arabs in particular, um, that was being produced. And also, uh, you know, it, this was uh, throughout um, you know, my field work, whether it was the mobilizations around the Gulf, right? The kind of uh, the, uh, the Google bombing of the Persian Gulf where um, very problematic anti-Arab sentiments were produced and a particular kind of Iranianness 
um, was imagined in Wittlogeson, or uh, discussion around sexuality, where actually uh, it was uh, the, the people, the intellectuals, uh, self claimed um, uh, intellectuals who were very much uh, adamant about we have to be democratic and this and that, they were uh, very much heteronormative and they were excluding women in their discussions and in particular queers. Um, and the best case scenario was when homosexuality was discussed in a very normative way. So, um, you know, those who basically um, uh, were outside of these imaginations of a kind of normative form of, um, uh, you know, uh, sexuality, be it heterosexuality uh, or uh, homosexuality, and that was very much actually framed in this binary, um, were uh, all about how to be a good citizen for the future of Iran in very normative way and according to norms of um, you know, nuclear family and nationalism and so on and so forth. So that was uh, one aspect, uh, what I call cyber governmentality. So uh, what I um, uh, mean by that is that um, unlike the forms of um, uh, theory about uh, or theories around civil society that sees civil society as oppositional to the state and see a kind of a top-down um, relationship between state and civil society, um, I use the idea of, uh, or the Foucauldian notions of civil society as a, uh, as a part and parcel of governmentality. So I don't look at state as the only place from which power emanates, but I think about, <coughs> excuse me, the participation of um, civil society, whether it is institutions, whether it is, you know, the uh, kind of conversations that happen in cafes and, um, you know, one of the ways that Web Logosan was defined, for example, by uh, the godfather of Persian blogging was uh, uh, Persian blogs were cafes, right? They were kind of thinking, pointing to the Habermasian notion of um, salons and cafes and so on and so forth. So, um, that uh, it, it were uh, civil, uh, the way that I um, actually talked about it in the book is that civil society is very much a site of governmentality. Um, so I'm talking about governmentalization of the state that happens beyond the realm of how state is often imagined. Um, and thinking about how, uh, whether it is uh, nonprofits, whether it is diasporas, they participate in um, enabling a form of power uh, that uh, normalizes the population at large, right? Rather than having the uh, kind of thinking about disciplinary power of the state, uh, I'm talking about both the disciplining of bloggers uh, by other bloggers in web blogism, whether it is gender disciplining or, you know, forms of disciplining that involves um, <clears throat> exclusion of others, um, the others of the nation, um, or whether it is kind of producing a normative notion of Iranianness and imagining a future for Iran according to that normative um, idea of what it means to be a good Iranian, how, what it means to be a good exceptional Iranian in a sense um, against Iran's neighbors, against the terrorists, right? So how, how to be modern all also was very much uh, an obsession of some of these uh, bloggers. I have to say that, uh, of course, there were 100,000, like I said, more than 100,000 blogs, and I obviously could not read every one of them. So the ones that I was reading were the ones um, that really uh, uh, are written by diasporic Iranians and uh, focus on the politics of homeland. And of course, because blogs are very much dialogic, I do include, um, uh, as uh, you uh, probably have seen, um, blog posts but, uh, by Iranian uh, feminists in particular in Iran who are writing about um, Iranian um, rights movement and the protests that were happening, the sit-ins uh, that Iranian women uh, were having around the, for example, 2005 um, presidential election and so on and so forth. So cyber governmentality is one argument in the book, which is basically Web Logistan is a site of transnational civil society and as such, and exactly because of that is a site of governmentality in cyberspace, right? So um, 
uh, and that it doesn't have as its goal just normalizing bloggers, but the Iranian population at large. Um, if you remember in um, part of the book I talk about, one of the books, We Are Iran, which basically portrays this uh, kind of assumption that um, bloggers were, uh, uh, you know, a, a sample or kind of a, a, an image of Iran as a whole. Um, and of course, there were many uh, disillusionments happened uh, when uh, Ahmadinejad uh, won the election, uh, despite all the um, enthusiasm that many bloggers, including myself, um, had at that, that point um, about Moin, the uh, reformist candidate. Um, so cyber governmentality then is one element, and then I contextualize that um, in relationship to what is the title of the book, Politics of Rightful Killing. And uh, what I mean by politics of rightful killing is again, thinking about how weblogism or the historical moment when weblogism really emerged. And that is shortly after uh, September 11, 2001. So whether it was an, uh, a coincidence or not, uh, it was uh, weblogism was inevitably um, implicated in discur discourses of uh, so-called war on terror. Um, and you could see um, um, some of the bloggers like, you know, Hossein Darakhshan, who started uh, popularizing um, uh, Persian blogs. He wasn't the first one who wrote the first blog, uh, Simon Jobery was the first one, but Hoder is known for uh, popularizing blogs. Um, talking about how he started it, uh, how he started blogging in response to stereotypes about Iranians and also how he wanted it to be a bridge um, and a window and also a cafe. So those were the metaphors that he was using. And actually I met uh, Hodor the first time um, at a, a conference called Bits and Bytes uh, at Harvard. And that was where actually he was um, uh, on a panel with uh, a Mili blogger, a US military blogger, and two Iraqi brothers who uh, uh, were famous for writing uh, a blog from Iraq. And of course, you know, the investments um, that um, uh, the US had in also the uh, in kind of in tandem with the uh, military occupation, uh, the kind of cultural, uh, uh, you know, form of, um, liberation that was happening and through, uh, you know, internet projects. And I write about um, those internet freedom projects, of course, in Iraq that were happening uh, at that time. And um, so uh, the, the investment uh, that was um, uh, basically uh, that, that existed by the uh, US Department of State in democratization projects in the Middle East, in particular in Iraq, and then of course in Iran through the money that uh, I mentioned earlier, um, were very much a part of um, this idea of um, liberation that has its um, uh, roots, uh, as I argue in the book, in um, the Cold War kind of ideology of um, uh, uh, color revolutions, right? So if it was, um, say, orange uh, revolution in Ukraine, it was um, actually someone in Weblogistan hailed uh, Persian blogs or uh, Persian blogging as Enghelobe uh, Firuzei, turquoise revolution. So, um, so this idea of actually um, many of these think tanks, including some of the conservative uh, think tanks and also uh, very conservative elements such as CPD Committee for um, um, uh, Present Danger that had emerged actually in response to uh, the Soviet earlier and became active after the so-called war on terror, were very much saying, why are we not looking at blogs, Persian blogging? You know, Persian blogging can give us access to what's happening in Iran and we can send information also through blogs to Iran. And um, so this idea of um, Use, uh, investing so much that it continued beyond Bush's administration. Of course, Obama also spent quite a bit of money in this um, uh, 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 democratization pro uh, programs, uh, uh, projects. Um, and uh, if you remember, for example, in 2000, 
uh, was it 2009 when uh, in his speech, and, uh, you know, he talked about lifting the electronic curtain on Iran using very much again the uh, language of the Cold War. Um, so, so there was this huge investment in liberation of Iran, sending basically proxies um, to Iran, Department of State, basically contracting um, these uh, private companies uh, to send proxies to Iran so that Iranians have access to internet, which all sounds great. People should have access to internet, right? But at the same time, there was this paradox while there is, you know, this kind of investment in internet democratization, at the same time, you have the harshest uh, and deadliest sanctions imposed on the people of Iran that is making basically, uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, the case was uh, uh, in Iraq, uh, the Iranian popul population disposable. So it's kind of the slow death. People are uh, suffering from sanctions and then they're very much interested at the same time to uh, uh, give access to internet. So this is the paradox that um, I connect to the notion of politics of rightful killing, which is basically uh, a population like the Iranian population um, is apt for democratization at the same time that it becomes killable, right? So it's kind of this um, idea of being produced discursively through the notion of rights, while it is exactly because of those rights that at any moment the Iranian population can become disposable and killable, whether it is through sanctions or you know, when it's time through military occupation. And this is basically the theoretical framework that I use. And I, again, draw from notions of biopolitics, which, and ethical politics, to think about how the Iranian population is seen, unlike, say, the Palestinian people who are kind of, you know, uh, uh, if you think about uh, Ashil Mbembe or um, uh, Georgia Agamben, talk about people who are stripped of rights, right, uh, the, or stripped um, or are reduced to bare life. The Iranian population uh, is, is not quite uh, stripped of rights, in a sense. Um, uh, it lives a lone life. Someone actually, you know, I'm sure you have heard this. Um, I've uh, heard this from many people, but uh, when one of my interlocutors in particular said, oh, right? we have a loaned life. So our life can be spent or you know, uh, expan uh, 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 expanded at any moment. So there is this kind of liminal space between biopolitics and necropolitics that I'm talking about when I talk about politics of rightful killing. Um, and that is um, you know, uh, what I see with blog as, as participating uh, in uh, this politics of rightful killing, in particular, a group of diasporic bloggers who <coughs> used this particular uh, moment during the war on terror to produce a particular kind of information about Iran um, uh, and, you know, to market it uh, uh, as, uh, you know, in think tanks or whatnot, or through the uh, funding that some got to start, um, um, uh, you know, websites and so on and so forth, um, to produce a particular kind of information about uh, Iran and as such become neoliberal entrepreneurs. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, uh, through that uh, process kind of expose um, the Iranian population to the politics of rightful killing, which goes hand in hand with the notion of a normalization and cyber governmentality, because the aspects that con is concerned with biopolitics, governmentality, and normalizing power is about producing a kind of democratic Iranian subject, right, that is apt for democratization and for a, a future, demo uh, you know, so-called democracy in Iran, but at the same time can, uh, poses a risk and lives a lone life and can be killable at any time. I keep talking, so I'll stop here and let you ask me more questions. No, about, that, that um, was, that is wonderful. I, that was such a great way that the uh, contextual, historical, and ethnographic, and the theoretical sort of come together in the book in the notion of uh, rightful killing. And I think I, I read the book and I was thinking about this, the, the way that um, the literature on biopolitics and ethical politics and sovereign power are mm -hmm. brought together in, uh, in, in this very timely theorization of uh, rightful killing. 
Um, so I suppose I one and, and then one thing that the book does is also moving between uh, early uh, beginnings of war and terror, uh, mm -hmm. 2003, 2004, uh, where an Iraq war starts after 9-11 and then the contemporary moment. Um, and and uh, it's striking that the thread, the theoretical thread, is able to sp to address very the, the variations that we have seen in this moment. Of course, we are at a moment today where uh, the you know architect of war and terror, or one of them, George W. Bush, is now a critic mm -hmm. of Donald Trump. Um, but um, but but then we see a same. Uh, sort of inertia of rightful killing, uh, if we can use that term. Um, so another. Um, so I guess my question is, how how do we how, how do you situate the how do you think about the evolution of rightful mm -hmm. killing over the last two decades or roughly two decades? Um, and I and I'm one of the things that it sort of explains, and I would like to point out is how. Um, there was a there was a moment uh, in early 2000s after 9/11 where um, Iran and the U.S. could come together in relationship to uh, a fight against um, Al Qaeda and Taliban brand of militancy. Um, earlier, before 9/11, mm -hmm. Taliban had attacked Iranian consulate in Afghanistan, and mm -hmm. Iranian diplomats were killed. Iran. Um, condemned 9/11, and and there was a there's a series of popular and governmental expressions of condolences and mm -hmm. solidarity in relationship to violence of that event. Mm -hmm. uh, but then um, quickly, Iran was categorized as part of the axis of evil, and mm -hmm. perhaps it is precisely because uh, Iranian population is not. Um, it, it is projected rights, but not the right kind of rights, I don't know, that mm -hmm. then the inertia of uh, rightful killing politics sort of takes over. Mm -hmm. And uh, the facts are, uh, the historical facts and connections are obfuscated because of the mm -hmm. dominant paradigm that, um, mm -hmm. that Iran is interpreted within. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think you're right. And, you know, uh, uh, despite the changes in ad administrations in the U.S. or in Iran, whether you have reformists or conservatives uh, in power or in the U.S., um, I would say after the Iranian revolution, uh, pretty much Iran has been placed, whether, you know, Bush named it after the uh, attacks uh, on the Twin Towers or uh, whatnot, Iran um, has been uh, kind of placed uh, within this uh, kind of uh, very limited idea of what it means um, to be a threat to American democracy or to the international uh, civil society in a sense, right? So um, if you think about the sanctions, um, soon after the Iranian revolution, Iran was subjected to sanctions, uh, right? So, and actually you can think about even before the revolution, uh, really the first sanctions were imposed on Iran in, uh, in 1950s after the nationalization of oil. So these are really ways of kind of disciplining um, the um, you know uh, the Iranian state, but uh, it's also uh, it's not really unlike the kind of binary that um, often the uh, U.S. hawks draw between the Iranian state and the Iranian people. Um, these sanctions are really affecting the Iranian people, right? So uh, there isn't that kind of binary <laughs> that uh, uh, is assumed um, in uh, in the logic be, uh, behind these sanctions. So yes, Iran. Um, I mean. If you think about uh, even the nuclear deal that uh, actually was a relief for many Iranians, uh, even though it didn't lift all sanctions, of course, but even the logic behind it is that Iran is um, not rational enough to have um, uh, to, to be developing nuclear weapons, but the U.S. is, Israel is, right? But Iran is this risky, again, Iranians in general are um, these risky subjects, right? That at any point uh, can become volatile, can become terrorists in a sense. So that is part of, again, if you, um, I mean, you, you did mention um, parts of the book where I bring it to the uh, present moment. And one of the examples I bring is um, the uh, Cyrus Cylinder that uh, some Iranian diasporics, of course, uh, you know, who uh, want to uh, 
display their market virility that you know we have money whether it's through shots of sunset shows or whatnot to basic or through giving a gift like that very i would say tacky um uh, statue to uh, to the city of Los Angeles. It is really to try to um, uh, kind of um, uh, it's as a, a way of um, proximity to whiteness, right, and becoming in a sense uh, exceptional citizens, folding themselves into this idea of what it means to be a good American citizen or you know a, a good democratic subject in a sense, but. Um, uh, once you actually look at um, how, whether it is Iranians in diaspora or Iranians in Iran are framed within the uh, political discourse uh, uh, of our time, uh, you, you, you will see that uh, despite this desire uh, that you see among Iranian, not all, of course, I'm talking about the kind of hegemonic forms of Iranianness that are um, displayed, like I said, in Shahs of Sunset uh, or through these kind of, um, uh, you know, gestures such as the Cyrus Cylinder and so on and so forth report that are of course very much racialized right it's a particular kind of racialization of Iranians that happens through these gestures um, despite that uh, Iranian population the Iranian population is seen as one that um, uh, within itself has the risk of becoming um, uh, danger so it's kind of like the this line between risk and danger is very thin when it comes um, to um, uh, to uh, the idea of Iranianness. So yes, it is, you know, uh, despite how Iran may have uh, fought, I mean, think about Soleimani, right? He was actually fighting Daesh and he was in many senses an ally to the US. But, you know, again, when um, uh, one uh, is no longer useful, uh, right to this kind of agendas, to the, I would say, um, empire building agendas and um, the expansionist ideas um, uh, uh, or the expansionist projects and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a sense, goals uh, of uh, the US, then one becomes disposable. And I argue that even in the context of bloggers, right, it's not just this macro kind of uh, idea, but I, I do talk about bloggers who were part of uh, the kind of initial group of bloggers who were really trying to work with think tanks and uh, or get the funding, whether it was from the Dutch parliament for democratization projects or from the US Department of State, how they become disposable to when they lose their political usefulness. So, uh, um, and that goes back to the concept of loaned life in a sense, exactly because how risk and danger kind of stick to Iranian bodies, right? Uh, to borrow from Sarah Ahmed or, you know, Jasper Poir's book in thinking about how affect works in relationship to uh, uh, particular bodies who are queered racially, right? So, yes. um, and, and you're absolutely pointing directly in, in, in a less direct way to the way that the, the uh, lens of gender and sexuality allows us mm -hmm. to see this dimension of mm -hmm. operations of power uh, transnationally. Uh, so I was, I suppose I'm, my question is whether, you, what do you think uh, that that lens um, enhances? How do you think that this, this lens of gender and sexuality enhances the ways that we understand uh, power and politics, uh, politics of freedom and rights specifically in relationship to mm -hmm. Iran? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And I think, you know, often people, um, when I say people, not scholars of gender and sexuality, but, you know, when people think about politics, often leave out gender and sexuality as if, you know, they're tangential or they don't uh, enter the realm of politics. And that is, of course, you know, because of the history of what it means uh, or, you know, disciplinary, of course, uh, formations um, and also the way that uh, politics um, and, uh, you know, the notion of civil society itself is very much uh, defined as gen uh, in a very gendered way. But of course, if we think about sexuality um, and gender uh, as um, the kind of axis of analysis and not 
think about them just as identities, but think about them as a part of the assemblage of power um, that um, uh, assumes uh, rights to some people and denies them to others, we can see how um, sexuality can be actually a very uh, central uh, you know, access of analysis. And in particular, when it comes to the notion of rights, of course, I'm not the first one to argue this. Many people have written about how uh, this idea of um, uh, the rescuing uh, 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 women and queers in the name of rights, right? So you know, there is, of course, has a colonial history of um, uh, the uh, colonizers basically legitimizing, um, uh, you know, colonial occupation, whether it's settler colonialism or colonialism um, in uh, the name of rescuing women who are supposed to be uh, oppressed, who are supposed to be victims of their uh, savage, barbaric, or, you know, repressive cultures. So this is no different than that. And we see that legacy repeating itself, of course, within the discourse of uh, uh, human rights, women's rights. We saw how that was actually used um, uh, in the case of Afghanistan or Ira uh, Iraq. And we see that, you know, the same kind of discourse um, of also repeating itself, whether it is by, um, you know, the um, uh, US um, uh, or whether it is by some uh, elements of the Iranian diaspora who basically assume themselves to be the representatives of Iranian women and really hijack and uh, appropriate Iranian women's um, uh, you know, struggles um, to uh, and portray them as victims uh, in order to basically legitimize uh, the uh, kind of um, opportunistic, in a sense, appropriations that uh, we, we see today. And we see some of these people are very much uh, kind of uh, allies with Trump and Pompeo. <laughs> and mm -hmm. they're, um, they're really, you know, and I, I do make this argument when I talk about the Iranian women's movement and Iranian women bloggers in Iran and how uh, they were very much caught between, uh, you know, those who, uh, are trying to appropriate um, uh, their cause and then between the Iranian state that actually accuses uh, activists, including Iranian women's, uh, 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 women's rights activists of being colluded by so-called you know, Western powers or by foreigners and actually punishing them in the name of national security. So it is really uh, 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 this form of appropriation um, that also happens in um, the internet, and this is how we can think about beyond web logs and how it's happening in Twitter or Instagram and so on and so forth is actually hurting the genuine legi uh, and legi legitimate um, struggles and contestations of um, uh, Iranian women or you know other social movements in Iran. Um, I'm, I'm, I am personally very thankful that uh, by bringing gender and sexuality as an axis of analysis, as you put it, you are relating the risk that Iranians and Iranian population poses within a global political discourse to the risk that queer and non-normative sexu sexualities pose to national formations of belonging in general. And I think this is absolutely um, new and an important contribution of the book to contemporary theorizations of Iran. There are more historical works and I think but what the book really foregrounds this conversation and I'm very thankful and I hope that um, many of us can engage with it um, for, for this and among other reasons. But in the interest of time, let me move to another theme and that's um, sure. uh, technology and mobility mm -hmm. and what you describe as homeland politics in relationship to mm -hmm. Iran. Um, and I'm wondering whether you, were, you would be willing to speak about and situate the internet and the connectivities mm -hmm. and mobilities that it produces in a longer history of media technology and Iranian politics. Of course, we know from 19th century until um, the contemporary moment, different forms of media from press, uh, radio, pamphlets, uh, cassettes, 
uh, video cassettes um, before the internet and as you, you you began with the satellite TVs, if you remember the VHS and Betamax um, mm -hmm. recordings that would circulate in Iran every year around the new year usually. Yes. Um, and and so, so these technologies and also oftentimes coming from abroad even uh, in the 19th century, so from mm -hmm. India, uh, Istanbul, from the Middle East, and in 20th century from from Europe, uh, famous uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's lectures or other others from Najaf and, and Paris that circulated in Iran before the revolution. So there's a mm -hmm. there's this very um, uh, there's this historical precedence connecting diaspora or or exile politics and um, and uh, and technology and domestic politics in Iran. And I wonder whether diaspora and exile is also kind of a key, key, uh, key difference precisely because the diaspora community in the US after the revolution has such a specific kind of politics and attachments. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, you know, vis-a-vis -vis revolution, Islam, and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. how would we think about the internet and um, uh, and cyber governmentality in this longer history of media technologies? I think you know, uh, as I said before, you know, this goes back to thinking also about notions of civil society that, and you know, thinking um, beyond this idea that internet enables. Uh, the formation of a kind of civil society in Iran for the first time, as you said, you know, whether it is civil society or the use of technology in mobilization um, does not start with the internet. Of course, because of its speed and because of the way that um, uh, it became popularized, um, uh, you know, uh, in particular, I would say uh, after actually 2000s, I mean, internet went to Iran uh, in uh, long before that, right? Of course, the infrastructure that the state provided enables uh, uh, that too. And I write about that in the book and, uh, you know, Ghulam Khiabani, for example, uh, uh, has written about that um, uh, as well. Uh, but yes, you're right. I mean, uh, we can think about uh, the role of technology in particular when it comes to diaspora in keeping uh, kind of a, a form of um, connectivity uh, with Iran um, and as a way of uh, circulation of information. Um, and, you know, so before the internet, the circulation of information uh, for the most part also involved the kind of movement of bodies, right? Uh, who brings those VHSs and all that to Iran or uh, uh, Imam Khomeini's, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, tapes. But I would also, you know, again, emphasize that um, despite the importance of, and I know that people have written about the tapes, you know, uh, 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 and uh, the role in actually um, the emergence of the Iranian revolution. But um, we have to also think about other ways um, that um, uh, these forms of contestations and social movements became possible in Iran, right? Mosques, right? Women's jealousies, right? Uh, taxi cabs. So um, many other ways that um, um, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, the, the possibility of social movements um, uh, emerged uh, in, in the history of Iran. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm neither someone who is basically saying technology has no role, right? I, I, I don't kind of have this dystopia around internet, nor am I an internet enthusiast or a technocentric, basically, person who um, uh, gives all the credit to technology. Of course, you know, in particular, as an anthropologist, I'm very much also interested in uh, other ways that people um, uh, uh, exchange information or uh, mobilize, um, of course. Um, so I would, um, you know, I, I would uh, also uh, think about, I mean, uh, the, the ways that uh, the circulation of information, uh, yes, with the internet has become faster and it has become um, uh, more widespread. Of course, again, we have to be careful in thinking about who has access to internet in Iran, despite these assumptions that even in the US that everyone has access to the internet. Um, 
still up to this day having access to um, high speed internet is uh, very much a class based issue right and um, uh, also the rural kind of the so called digital divide is very much a reality for many people so I think we need to also take into consideration um, those elements in thinking about how technology basically uh, is implicated or is, is used uh, for social movements. Um, and I would say in uh, the example that you brought with Ayatollah Khomeini's tapes, of course, uh, that may have mobilized a particular um, segment of uh, the Iranian population, but of course, you know, uh, we have, um, many Iranians uh, know that, that it wasn't just an Islamic revolution, that it became an Islamic revolution later, but uh, there were many socialists and communists who were also uh, mobilizing and it wasn't just, um, I mean, you know, we can um, again uh, think beyond one narrative of how the revolution basically took place. And same thing with thinking about the uh, mobilizations that happened in Iran uh, and continue to happen in Iran um, uh, in post revolutionary Iran. So I would uh, say, yes, technology is definitely um, uh, important, in particular in thinking about diasporic politics, but uh, it is not uh, the way or the only way um, that the circulation of information um, uh, happen. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And perhaps uh, for the concluding uh, thought, and this is something I, uh, I have been grappling with, and I, I, I sort of wrote down actually this question before we, um, we spoke, and it's about the uh, what, if, if, you, if you will, a chilling effect of the book or your analysis on what we might call Iranian dreams of freedom, democracy, and civil society, of gender and religious equality, of more expansive possibilities of sexual self-expression in Iran and also in its diasporas. Um, your analysis very much shows that the spaces such as the Blogistan that are relatively thought about as immune to government regulation are deeply inflicted by governmental politics, by cyber governmentality, that democracy and practices of civil society that are popular aspirations that have been related to Iran's the 1979 revolution, the constitutional revolution, mm -hmm. are virtual performances and stated goal of basically foreign armies uh, in relationship to Iran and Middle East. That, that Iranians who are in many ways struggling against or mobilizing against the Islamic Republic's regulation of gender and sexual norms themselves reproduce disciplinary regimes of gender and sexual regulation. Uh, and I understand that as a piece of critical scholarship, you're asking this to sort of really examine our assumptions and everyday practices and the way that we are subjectivated by these discourses and reproduce them. I, I just simply want to register this as a challenge that the book poses to all of us to think about Iran and, um, and, and its relationship to sort of century, two centuries long dreams of democracy and constitutional government and, uh, and a rights uh, discourses um, that predates um, the kinds of war and terror discourse that rights have come to be entangled with. Um, and I'm wondering if you would uh, address this point and specifically in relationship to what you describe towards the end of the book very evocatively and very suggestively about politics and ethics of pessimism. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so um, I think um, you uh, raise a really good question, which is, you know, um, of course, history doesn't begin at that moment of um, September 11, 2001, right? There have been struggles for freedom, for liberation uh, from Mashruta time, you know, to, to now. Uh, what I'm writing about is very much um, a particular historical moment. And that is uh, within the context of the so-called war on terror. And um, in the book, I actually uh, uh, write about the kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, periodization of uh, how I see the uh, kind of how um, weblogism fits within one particular um, uh, 
uh, moment of the Iranian history. And I actually even go beyond um, the so-called war on terror and write about 1989, which is basically the, uh, you know, when um, Ayatollah Khomeini died, the liberalization of Iranian economy begins, the reform movement starts, and also we have the uh, fall of the Soviet and the emergence of this notion of a valorization of the notion of civil society in the context of uh, Eastern Europe. So that is, you know, how I'm framing the book. Um, and um, this is not to basically, when I write about pessimism, is not to say, oh, well, you know, there is no such a thing as freedom, so let's stop fighting for it, that we are all doomed. No, uh, what I'm writing about uh, in that particular, you know, very brief actually towards the end, and that is something that I'm hoping to be a starting point for my next um, project that I'm uh, working on is to think about this Zendeginis here, this lone life, but at the same time knowing that while we, uh, while Iranians in Iran are living uh, a lone life, they don't give up hope, right? And that is exactly because of um, that sense of urgency and not having the privilege of kind of uh, being hopeless in a sense because um, and I write about, in particular, sanctions and personal experience with uh, my own sister um, dying from cancer. And while she knew, you know, she didn't have much um, time left and the difficulty of having access to medicine, to cancer medicine, exactly because of the sanctions, um, she continued to uh, translate books for environmental justice <laughs> in Iran. And also um, she was a part of the, uh, uh, you know, youth encyclopedia. So that's a very forward looking and thinking about right, the next generation uh, while knowing that one, um, you know, one's life is also very much expendable exactly because of being uh, caught in this, uh, you know, this paradox that I call the politics of rightful killing in the book. So uh, when I talk about pessimism, I talk about pessimism as um, a possibility of politics and a possibility of a futurity that is otherwise denied to um, the Iranian people um, because of the uh, both uh, kind of repression by the state and also the pressure uh, from um, the, um, the empire, in a sense, and, uh, and also the sanctions. So um, it is really a way of thinking about uh, uh, hope beyond, again, going back to thinking about sexuality and queer theories, beyond this kind of liberal notion of it gets better, right? That no, we know it's not getting better. I mean, look around us, California is burning, <laughs> you know, the, the world is uh, falling apart, but that doesn't mean that we just have to give up, right? It means that we have a lot, lot of work to do. And if we want to kind of think about a futurity, we have to think uh, with a form of skepticism, I think, rather than assuming that uh, these beautiful and kind of very romanticized notions of uh, democracy are gonna, uh, you know, take us there. So that is how I end. It's not necessarily um, a doom, but thinking of pessimism as, um, like I said, the possibility of politics. Thank you so much, Dr. Shahsari. That was a um, very insightful conversation book. I am very much excited to your new, about your new project. And I wanna Thank point you. out as somebody who is, who thinks about translation, how notion of loaned life is you are trans you are constantly translating it from Persian to English. It comes from Zendegi Nesye. It's not some uh, something you it has a specific quality of of yes. coming from Persian uh, and, and this uh, context. And I appreciate that as well. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And um, you know uh, uh, Thank you for reading the book and for um, talking to me about it. Of course. And I hope that we could have conversations in person very soon. Absolutely. Same here. <laughs> Bye. Merci. Bye. Thank you. Bye.